Welcome everyone um, to our quarterly webinar. I am Lena Mattel. I'm the uh, Associate Medical Director for McPat for Moms, and I will be kicking us off in our quarterly uh, webinar. Um, today's topic is, our, uh, is trauma in the birthing process, promoting health equity and trauma-informed care in perinatal mental health. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Um, the session will be recorded and available on the McPat for Moms website, www.mcpatformoms.org. Um, a copy of the PowerPoint slides will be available on our website under the Toolkits and Resources page um, labeled PowerPoint Presentations. Our presenter, uh, Dr. Okwaraku, will uh, stop uh, at, at some mo moments to answer some questions and we'll have uh, some time allocated at the end for Q&A. Um, if you have a question or comment, please type it into the question box um, in Zoom and we will read out your question at the end and unmute your line if you uh, would like to add anything um, at the end during the Q&A session. Um, and after the uh, presentation, there will be a brief survey and we'd really appreciate your feedback uh, so we can continue to improve. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, uh, Jennifer Aquaricu, who is a uh, board certified psychiatrist and also one of our women's mental health fellows at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, where we've had the pleasure of working with her for two years um, as she's grown uh, in her specialty uh, for with, within reproductive psychiatry. Uh, she has completed her residency locally at Cambridge Health Alliance and is a graduate of um, undergraduate training at Harvard College and medical school training at University of Virginia and also carries a Master of Science in Narrative Medicine from Columbia University. Uh, Jennifer is an amazing uh, individual and human being, and we have just loved working with her. She is passionate about social justice, a beautiful writer, and I think you're really going to, um, I feel very fortunate to be able to share uh, her with all of you um, in this presentation uh, today. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for the introduction. I am really honored to be here and excited to give this talk today. So I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see this? Yes. Good, okay. So I have no conflicts of interest. Um, and I just wanna start out by describing some of the learning objectives or ho hopefully some of the actionable takeaways that you'll get by the end of this talk. So hopefully you'll be able to describe trauma and the elements of a traumatic birth, understand influence of systemic inequity, discrimination, bias, and bias on trauma and trauma-related stress disorders, articulate the impact of trauma on psychiatric, obstetric, and pediatric health, and appreciate the principles of a trauma-informed trauma approach to obstetric care. So the word trauma is often, you know, it's like thrown around a lot. So I just kind of wanted to go back to the basics and really define what it is. And I'm leaning on a definition um, put forth by SAMHSA, that's the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. Thinking broadly, SAMHSA defines trauma as a result of an event or series of events or circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the ability on the individual's functioning and their mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. So that's the three E's: an event, an experience, and the negative effect. So what is a traumatic event? Basically, it's like exposure to something bad. In clinic, when I talk to my patients and I screen them for trauma, I, I ask like, has there been anything big or bad or scary that has really happened to you in your life? In the DSM, that's the Diagnostic and Statistical, Statistical Manual, that's kind of like the diagnostic Bible in psychiatry. Um, they define like bad things as death or threatened death, actual or threatened serious injury or actual or threatened um, sexual violence. How is trauma experienced? So it can be experienced through personal exposure. Um, it can, you can witness trauma, you can experience it vicariously. And that means like you learn that somebody you love has experienced a trauma that can be vicariously traumatizing or through repeated or extreme indirect exposure to trauma. So that is important and relevant for us in the medical profession because this often happens in the line of professional duty. Like for example, first responders collecting body parts after an explosion, that can be a traumatizing experience. Um, or professionals repeatedly ex uh, exposed to the details of child abuse, that can also be a traumatizing experience. 
trauma is pervasive. So I have this picture here of the drop of water having this uh, ripple effect. Trauma, it doesn't happen in silos. So as I mentioned, you know, trauma can occur on these four different levels, and I kind of wanted to put it into a clinical context. So a patient can experience a direct trauma. Somebody can witness that patient experiencing direct trauma. It could be their family, it could be their community, or it could be you as a clinician can witness those traumas. Because as we all know, traumatic things can happen in clinical spaces as well. Vicariously, again, the patient's family or the community might be witnessing or hearing of these traumas. And then the repeat or indirect exposure, again, as clinicians, um, we're vulnerable to that as well. And in this scheme, like we can be the clinicians, but we ourselves can also be the patient. And that just shows that, again, trauma doesn't happen in silos. It can have these ripple effects and a single event can impact multiple people. So I wanna call your attention now to the um, ACE studies. So ACE studies are kind of our landmark trauma studies and ACE stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. So during, in the ACE studies, the surveyors um, looked at a sample of primarily white, non-Hispanic non individuals with some college education. And in their study, they found that 64% of these people surveyed had at least one adverse childhood experience. Like, like for example, witnessing uh, violence inside the home. And 12.5% of these people experience four or more um, ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. Obviously, this study was problematic because it wasn't very diverse or generalizable to the um, uh, a broader population. So they repeated the study with a more diverse sample of adults who had completed some high school and found that 83.2% of people who responded to the survey reported at least one traumatic event, and nearly 40% of people reported at least four or more or more events. That's all to say that trauma is pretty pervasive. Like I said, it doesn't only occur in, sil um, in silos, it has this ripple effect. Subsequent to the original ACE studies, other studies of trauma have um, gone beyond the original conception, which is adverse childhood experiences, to include other ACEs, like adverse community experiences and even adverse climate experiences. And I really like this um, illustration because it kind of shows the three different ACEs. This tree can symbolize stuff that happens in early childhood or like in your household. Things like bullying, witnessing domestic violence, um, physical and emotional neglect, um, having parents with substance abuse issues, um, childhood sexual assault or abuse. Um, community ACEs, those can include things like discrimination, historical trauma, um, poor access to jobs, food, food scarcity. Um, and then we have the environmental ACEs, things that happen in the environment. And here is listed as pandemics. I think that's particularly relevant for us like living through the, the COVID pandemic, but that's also can be things like, you know, living in a war-torn country, you know, like Ukraine um, or uh, issues with of the climate crisis like wildfires in California or droughts. Those things can all be conceptualized as um, adverse experiences. And the point is, again, that trauma is pretty, pretty pervasive. Okay. Sorry, can you still see the screen? It's not advancing. Are you trying to advance the slide? Um, I haven't advanced yet, but it disappeared. Okay. Yes. I, I disappeared for me for a second. Okay. It's still visible. Okay. So then what is the effect of trauma? So it's possible to experience trauma without actually becoming traumatized or develop a disorder. Trauma itself is the antecedent to stress and trauma-related stress disorders. But when it becomes clinically significant, that's when you have uh, uh, the condition or disorder and it impairs your ability to function. So what are the diagnostic criteria for PTSD? Again, these are people who have experienced a trauma and then now are developing clinically significant um, symptoms. So we have symptoms of intrusion. Intrusion basically means you're re-experiencing the trauma in one or, more, one or more of the following ways. You know, you can have intrusive thoughts or um, involuntary memories about the trauma. You can have nightmares. You can have dissociative reactions like flashbacks where the patient feels like, you know, the trauma is happening to them like all over again, even though it's, it's not. 
you can have symptoms of avoidance. That really means like going out of your way to avoid trauma related uh, stressors or reminders like people or places or things, even sights or smells can be triggering of traumatic memories. You can have alter alterations in um, mood or cognition. That means you have an inability to recall key features of the trauma. You might adopt a negative worldview, like think that the world is completely dangerous or just have a negative attitude towards yourself. You might struggle with self-blame or blame other people for the fallout from the trauma. Persistent negative emotions like fear or horror, anger, guilt, or shame. You can have loss of pleasure in things. You can have a loss of social connectedness, like really feeling detached from others or your community. Um, and then you can have a loss of positive emotions like love and joy. Um, and then there's the cluster of symptoms um, categorized as like hyperarousal or alterations in arousal and reactivity. That basically means that your patient is always on guard. They're really watchful. They can't really relax. They always feel really keyed up. That can present as being really irritable or aggressive, participating in perceived self-destructive behaviors or reckless behaviors. Like I said, kind of being always on guard, hypervigilant, like feeling like danger is lurking around every corner. They can become a jumpy person, like have a, a, an exaggerated startle reflex. They can develop problems of concentration and then also um, disturbances in their sleep. And diagnostically, it's important to understand that these cluster of symptoms have to happen for at least one month or more. And they are not due to you know, another medication or substance abuse or illness. Um, <clears throat> So Judy Herman, um, she's one of the like world scholars in trauma. And I had the pleasure of learning from her while I did my training at the Cambridge Health Alliance. Um, she wrote a book, Trauma and Recovery. And in that book, she says, after a traumatic experience, the human system of self-preservation goes into permanent alert as if the danger might return at any moment. So, you know, Lena had mentioned that, or Dr. Mattel had mentioned that, um, I, you know, I'm a writer, so I really like to rely on metaphor to help my patients understand the things that I'm trying to describe. So now I, I kind of want to tell you the story or the experience of the bear and the butterfly. So imagine you are walking through the woods, you're minding your own business, going on a nice, you know, nature walk. And then all of a sudden a huge ferocious bear comes out of the bushes and like tries to eat you and like maul you when you are terrified. Your internal alarm systems are blaring. You scream, you kick it into high gear with your fight or flight response. You run, you have adrenaline like coursing through your body. Your heart is pounding and all you can sense is danger and you just hightail it out of there. You sprint as fast as you can to escape. When you are finally out of harm's way, think about how you might feel. You're probably out of breath. You're probably exhausted. You're probably terrified. Your muscles probably hurt. You're probably disoriented. You just feel terrible. Um, but eventually, you know, you come down from that heightened state. You come down from that surge of like protective stress hormones. When you have PTSD, you are basically locked in that heightened state. You know, as, as Dr. Herman described, you go into, you, you, um, you live in a state of permanent alert. So as a neurotypical person, after you are, you know, you escape the bear, you see a butterfly and you're like, oh, a butterfly, you think nothing of it. But for somebody with PTSD, you know, that fluttering in the peripheral vision is like, oh my God, the bear is back, even though it's a harmless butterfly. And so you are primed to have this heightened response. And that's a very difficult way to live. One of my favorite ways that this is described was in the book, What Happened to You? It's written by Dr. Bruce Perry, um, and it was written in collaboration with Oprah. Dr. Bruce Perry, he's a child and adolescent psychiatrist and also a trauma researcher. In the book, he describes the uh, state reactivity curve. And so I'm just gonna read a little excerpt from the book that really gives a beautiful description of what this is trying to illustrate. So in general, when a challenge or stressor occurs, it will push us out of balance and into, and it will push us out of balance and an internal stress response will be activated to get us back into balance. With no external stressors and no internal needs going unmet, um, we'll basically be in a state of calm. And as challenges and stress increase, our internal state will shift from alert to terror. As someone with a neurotypical stress response, there's a linear relationship between the degree of stress and the shift in internal state um, from um, calm to, to terror. 
these you can see here, this, this straight line represents the neurotypical state. Um, for example, in the face of a moderate stressor, a proportional activation will put the individual in an active alert state. If an individual has a sensitized stress response, this top curve um, caused by their history of trauma, even the most basic of daily challenges will induce the state of fear. Somebody with a sensitized stress response will respond to even moderate stress with a terror response. This overreactivity contributes to their emotional, behavioral, and physical health problems. So how do we begin to recognize trauma? You know, as I, as I had mentioned, trauma is insidious. And how does it show up in the clinic? Like I said, um, emotional, behavioral health issues, and physical health problems. So we're all hardworking clinicians. You know, we work morning till night, you know, in service of our patients, we sacrifice a lot. We're staying up late, doing notes, replying messages, returning calls, prior authorizations, the pharmacy, like you name it. This job is not, is not easy, but I hope at least most of us get pleasure from, from, from doing it. But you can start to get angry and frustrated when we encounter patients that seem to try and undermine all of that labor and intensive effort that we're pushing forward. You know, you start to feel struck, uh, stuck and frustrated when patients seem to reject our help or just make it difficult to do our job. So in the clinic, that might present as a patient being really irritable. You know, they might be rude to the staff or hostile. You know, they might have a number of no-shows or be like non-compliant with care. They might be overly demanding or participate in self-sabotaging self behaviors like um, uh, substance abuse. And so this leads to um, a sense within us of frustration, as I mentioned. You know, when you start feeling frustrated, you might start to ask the question like, oh, like what's wrong with you? One of my favorite things about psychiatry is that we use ourselves as kind of a clinical tool. If we start to feel a certain type of way, we use that as clinical data to inform our understanding of the patient and, other, and inform the way that our patients might be interacting with other people in the community or in the world outside of the clinical space. So I really want all of you to hold on to this feeling of frustration and that question that pops into your mind, like what's wrong with you? Because it's, it's a red flag and it's an important piece of clinical data. Trauma-informed care wants to push us from that, oh, like what happened to you to what happened to you? And these are the things that are happening to our patients, these multiple ACEs. And one of the North Stars or the guiding points that you wanna hold on to is that you don't wanna become an ACE for somebody. So marginalization is a form of trauma. Um, Dr. Bruce Perry, again, the author of that book, What Happened to You, he, he lays it out really nicely. Um, in the book, he says, I believe if you don't recognize the built-in biases in yourself and the structural biases in your systems, biases in, regarding race, gender, sexual orientation, you cannot truly be trauma-informed. Marginalized people, that, those are people who are excluded, minimized, and shamed, are traumatized peoples. And because as we've discussed, humans are fundamentally relational creatures. To be excluded or dehumanized in an organization, community or society you are part of results in prolonged uncontrollable stress that is sensitizing. He summarizes and says marginalization is a fundamental trauma. So this is a wheel of power and privilege. I like uh, this illustration because I think it really demonstrates what it is to be close to the seat of power, like the center of power and be marginalized, like occupy a position on the, outsk on the outskirts of the, of the um, of the circle. Um, so take a second and think about where you lie in these different um, uh, descriptors or, or, or identifiers um, and where you lie on this um, kind of like this, 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 this gradient of power and marginalization. As Dr. Perry described, to be excluded or dehumanized is to be subject to prolonged and uncontrollable stress. So privilege is basically favors bestowed upon dominant groups, often at the expense of marginalized groups. In the United States, you know, it's uh, privilege is granted to people who are, you know, white, able-bodied people, heterosexual people, males, Christians, property-owning people, people in middle age, um, and English-speaking people. You can see how, you know, just by virtue of logging onto this talk and being a clinician, you know, we are. The, the formal education, we have probably some of the most educated people in the world. Um, there is a power differential between us and our patients. 
it's important to understand what oppression is and how it operates. So oppression can be institutional and it can also be interpersonal and take the form of racism or sexism, heterosexism, ableism, classism, et cetera. Through oppressive systems, groups in the middle control marginalized groups by limiting their ability to access rights or freedom or basic resources like healthcare, education, employment, and housing. The targets of oppression are often subject to exploitation, marginalization, and powerlessness. And one of the key ideologies of oppression is that it denies that the oppression exists, which serves the function of keeping the marginalized people in their place. So when you ask yourself as a privileged person, ooh, like what's wrong with you? That kind of um, doesn't see the systems of oppression taking place, which is why trauma-informed care is asking the more compassionate what happened to you? And that's why we really wanna shift the focus to understanding the circumstances that are bringing the patients to where they are. So shifting gears to traumatic childbirth. Cheryl Beck is a professor at UConn, <coughs> excuse me. She's a professor of, at UConn School of Nursing. And she's also a researcher that has focused a lot of her career on postpartum depression and traumatic birth experiences. She's um, contributed a tremendous amount to the traumatic birth literature. In a 2004 paper, she described traumatic birth as an event occurring during labor delivery um, that basically involves actual or, or threatened serious injury or death to the mom or the baby. And the uh, birthing woman experiences intense fear, helplessness, loss of control, and horror. I use the word woman, obviously, because that's what she had represented um, in her paper, um, but birthing people in general. Um, in 2013, she further expanded this definition to include a situation in which a woman or birthing person perceives that she is stripped of her dignity. So you can conceptualize birth trauma um, in two ways, primary birth trauma and secondary birth trauma. Primary birth trauma is when the experience of childbirth itself is actually traumatic. And secondary birth trauma can occur when a person with a pre-existing trauma history or PTSD diagnosis is re-traumatized by the things that are happening during the process. What makes somebody vulnerable for traumatic birth? Risk factors include extremes of age, like you know, teen pregnancy, having your first baby, um, being of a low socioeconomic status or having low social support, being single, belonging to a racial or ethnic minority, having a prior psychiatric history like PTSD or other diagnosis or substance abuse, having access to limited, limited access to coping skills, um, having poor prenatal care, or having a fear of child tocophobia or having a fear of childbirth itself. This circle represents, it's kind of like another iteration of that power and privilege wheel. Up at the top, you see a lot of, um, uh, identities that are associated with privilege and down below are identities that are, are, are um, uh, associated with oppression. I've highlighted here or bolded some of the risk factors for traumatic birth that intersect or overlap with um, these oppressed identities. Again, having a teen birth or being of a low socioeconomic status or single or becoming, um, or being a member of a racial or religious or ethnic minority. Um, having a mental health diagnosis is a, um, uh, often means to have a marginalized existence or marginalized life um, and uh, substance abuse issues as well. So what are the intrapartum risk factors for traumatic birth? There are things that can happen again during um, the birth process that can be traumatizing. So this often occurs when a patient's expectation of how her birth or the person's birth will go are grossly misaligned with what actually takes place. Um, when the patient feels a total sense of powerlessness or loss of control during the process, if they have poor pain control, if they perceive a lack of empathy from their clinicians, if they don't really have a team to support them, like their partner or, a staff, or the staff are unsupportive, or if they have unforeseen um, interventions like a forceps delivery, um, vacuum, episiotomy, or C-sections. Cheryl Beck, um, she really summarizes that birth trauma is in the eye of the beholder. You know, things are routine to us day to day that are just kind of bread and butter ob or care. Um, to the patient, that could totally be the crisis of their life. So just because you don't perceive what happened as bad or 
or, or, or poor doesn't mean that the patient didn't experience it that way because birth trauma is in the eye of the beholder. And so in her work, Cheryl Beck summarized four themes that, are, are like, that she described when thinking about experiences of birth trauma. Number one is that the patients didn't feel all that cared for. Two is that they feel like communication was lacking, that things were happening to them and people weren't really telling them or informing them or allowing them to participate in the process of informed consent you know, as the care was happening. Three is that they feel like they didn't receive safe care. They feel like their trust was violated in that process. And four, that if interventions were happening, the clinicians justified it was like, oh, this is the safest thing to do. The ends justify the means, but the patients end up asking themselves, but at whose expense, at what price? Because they're the ones who have to kind of live with the repercussions or the outcomes of those interventions. So trauma can take place at a number of time points during the perinatal period. It can happen before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and after pregnancy. Um, before pregnancy, um, a patient can have PTSD as a pre-existing condition, or they can have prior reproductive trauma. That can include things like having a miscarriage or a traumatic abortion or uh, difficult infertility treatments. During pregnancy, trauma can be experienced like during the pregnancy itself. Like you can like be pregnant and like have an unrelated car accident or survive a natural disaster or be in a global pandemic. Those are traumatizing events that, that can occur during one's pregnancy. You can also have pregnancy rela related trauma which means you know, a patient might have severe hyperemesis or have like potential fetal, and, um, fetal abnormalities or prolonged hospitalizations, which can be traumatizing events. After pregnancy, like during childbirth, um, you can have unanticipated procedures, you can have a physically difficult delivery, you can have emergency. Um, uh, emergencies happen during childbirth, the baby or the fetus can be unstable, you can suffer a maternal hemorrhage, you know, you can have preeclampsia or a seizure. And then some people describe traumatic experiences around receiving general anesthesia. In terms of perinatal loss or neonatal complications, those can be things like NICU admissions, like being separated from your baby, um, maternal or neonatal readmission to the hospital. You can have like delayed postpartum hemorrhage. And then in terms of postpartum complications, again, those are things like NICU admissions, maternal, um, oh, sorry. Um, severe maternal mortality, like pulmonary embolism, severe preeclampsia, sepsis, cardiomyopathy, um, and severe hemorrhage. Those are things that all can be traumatizing within the perinatal period, like after the pregnancy has concluded. So what are the symptoms of perinatal PTSD? So before we had gone through the general um, symptom clusters of PTSD, but this is how specifically it can manifest in um, the perinatal population. So in terms of intrusion symptoms, you can have flashbacks or nightmares about your delivery. You can have intrusive or recurrent um, thoughts about being near death or you know, the, the delivery process itself. You can dissociate during breastfeeding or, or intercourse. Um, in terms of symptoms of avoidance, um, patients can delay naming their babies. They can avoid going to the NICU to see the baby. They can have a reluctance to being discharged. They can totally shut down around the pregnancy or delivery and not want to talk about it. Um, they can avoid sexual intimacy. They start missing postpartum appointments and have difficulty following up with pediatric care and missing well baby visits. And they can also avoid subsequent pregnancies. In terms of negative cognition and mood, they can again take on that kind of like negative attitude about the world. They can like be isolating themselves, have decreased infants. Uh, decreased interest and also have an impaired mother baby attachment. And then in terms of hyperarousal, again, they can be irritable, they can have sleep disturbance, and we know how important sleep is in the postpartum period. And they can also have an exaggerated startle response. In terms of the mental health consequences of traumatic birth, you know, some studies show that after experiences like this, women or birthing people can have increased depress depressive symptoms or anxiety following the traumatic birth. You know, these experiences can also really compromise um, a birthing person's um, self-concept or their self-efficacy. Like that means that their ability to feel that they can be a good parent and adequately care for their baby or adequately manage their baby if uh, an emergency thing happened. Um, and then they also may develop poor coping skills, like start relying on substances to self-medicate. In terms of obstetric consequences of birth trauma, you know, there might be fear of subsequent pregnancies, requests for sterilization, there may be terminations of subsequent pregnancies, 
more requests for elective C-sections, and just an increased mental health burden and increased mental health needs. In terms of pediatric consequences, excuse me. Um, their um, parental well-being is really central to um, a baby's development. Um, in the book, What Happened to You, Dr. Perry, he's a child and adolescent psychiatrist, he describes that the two months, the first two months of life have a disproportionately important impact on your long-term health and development. And this really has to do with the remarkable, um, remarkably rapid rate of brain development that happens in those first early few months. Like your brain is basically organizing all of the important and core regulatory networks. There's no shortage of evidence in both the pediatric and psychiatric literature documenting the known negative impacts of parental mental illness on children. PTSD can be one of these ACEs that itself can, be, can become an ACE for the baby, an adverse childhood experience. Um, so in the book, Dr. Perry describes that um, a child who has had only two months of really bad experiences during those early days um, does worse in the long term than a child with almost 12 years of bad experiences because of the timing of those experiences and the timing of the critical like organization of the brain and brain development. So that's why early intervention is so key and optimal that we, we have the ability or the opportunity to intervene sooner rather than later. You know, as we've discussed, adverse experiences heighten that stress reactivity curve. And this is how we see the intergenerational passing down of trauma from one generation to the next. And this is why me as a reproductive psychiatrist feel particularly passionate about this subject because it really gives us an opportunity to break that chain. We really want our moms to feel good during pregnancy, after pre before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and after pregnancy. Um, because mitigating those mental health symptoms can also help to prevent the baby from experiencing that ACE and then passing on um, their traumas as well. Um, so now I just want to talk a little bit about a trauma-informed approach to the perinatal period. So SAMHSA, um, that's the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, outlined key assumptions to a trauma-informed approach. They organized this 4R model, realize, recognize, respond, and resist re-traumatization. And basically, it's when a program or an organization or a system that is trauma-informed realizes the widespread impact of trauma and understands the potential paths for recovery, recognizes the signs, of, signs and symptoms of trauma in their clients, families, and staff, and others um, involved or interacting with the system, and responds by fully integrating knowledge about trauma into policies, procedures, and practices, and seeks to avoid re-traumatization. So hopefully, if I've done a good job, we've accomplished the realizing the impact of trauma and recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma. So I wanna to pivot to helping us learn how to respond to trauma. So we can do this in part by integrating this knowledge into practice. You know, as clinicians, you can screen your patients for risk factors in clinical assessments. You can ask open-ended questions in your you know, histories, like have you experienced any life, um, have you had any life experiences that can really negative, negatively impact your trauma or your parenting? You can also ask a similar question to what I asked, like have you in your life, have you had any kind of big, bad or scary things happen to you that you feel really has impacted your ability to be well? Um, and then there are also more formal screening skills and assessments for PTSD and trauma. Those include things like the perinatal PTSD questionnaire and the city, city birth trauma scale. Resisting traumatization. So this is an important one as well. We want to be able to identify elements or elements of care that might be triggering for our patients. A big one that often comes up in clinical care is the, recognizing the need to weigh medical education and allowing trainees to, you know, conduct multiple exams or ask questions like over again, over and over again, and then confirm, you know, the attending comes in and then confirms the history because those sorts of practices can be re-traumatizing for patients. So just really being sensitive to um, patients' triggers. Um, that can be also anticipating things like that, how vaginal exams may be difficult, having strangers or even like male clinicians in the room might be difficult. And then also evaluating our own act, um, uh, biases or the way that we talk about breastfeeding because that can also be triggering for patients as well. Um, 
So these are some principles of trauma-informed care. It really hones in on safety, their patient's ability to choose, a collaborative process, trustworthiness, and empowerment. Um, this slide really crystallizes a lot of the themes that I've kind of talked about along the way, but I think it does a beautiful job of really summarizing the principles that we can kind of aim for as we deliver care to our patients in a trauma-informed way. So thinking about safety, that's ensuring physical and emotional safety. Um, choice means that an individual has some choice and agency and control in these clinical um, encounters. Collaborations, meaning that decisions are made, are made jointly and patients aren't just being told what to do if they're told at all what's happening. Trustworthiness, um, meaning that there's clarity and consistency and like really strong but compassionate boundaries at play in the clinical encounters. And then empowerment, like prioritizing empowerment and skill building. Um, so at the Brigham, I've been working in our traumatic birth clinic. And part of what I do is help patients with trauma histories um, prepare for their labor and delivery. And I've come to understand birth planning as a form of trauma and trauma-informed care. Birth planning offers these patients an opportunity to really sit down and engage with a clinician in a way that enhances their sense of agency you know, and control. It allows you to do a lot of education around the birth process and their mental health within um, a labor and delivery process. Um, it allows for collaboration. It allows for open communication. It allows them to talk about what they're scared of and then allows um, us to really talk about, okay, what are we going to do to mitigate those factors and make sure that your birth process is, a, is, is goes as well as it can. We can also use this opportunity to manage expectations. Because as I mentioned, some patients have this ideal of what their birth will be, and then their birth goes completely different. And that's kind of like a breeding ground for traumatic experiences. So while I, you know, I have some patients who are, you know, have had emergency C-sections, and then they're like, no, I don't want a C-section, or I'm afraid of the C-section. And then, you know, we talk about, you know, obviously with their OB's input, talk about their vaginal delivery, um, and all the ways that we, we hope to prevent re-traumatization, but it also gives us an opportunity to say, you know, babies arrive in this world in the way that they're going to arrive. You know, we can make all the plans and that they're going to they're going to come the way that they're going to come. So it allows us to have a, a conversation in a safe space that allows us to manage expectation. Um, so I kind of superimposed um, the principles and practice of birth planning. So in terms of safety, you know, you want to think about who is going to be allowed to examine the patient. You don't probably don't want the med student and then the intern and then the resident and then the attending all doing the exams. You really want to focus on consent. And to a lot of patients with traumatic birth histories, especially sexual trauma, modesty is quite important to them. Um, you know, I, I have two kids. I've given birth myself and I feel like I've never been more naked in public in my, you know, in my life. So I kind of understand how um, modesty can be a big part of, of a trauma and how that can be um, kind of not really prioritized during the birth process with all the thing that's happening. In terms of choice, you wanna understand and advocate for the person, for the patient's birth preferences. In terms of collaborations, you wanna discuss any interventions before they take place and give, you know, when possible, give the patient an opportunity to answer questions. Um, in terms of trustworthiness, you wanna get all the clinicians on the same page. One thing that we've experienced is that, you know, a, patient might have a discussion with her OB and then she delivers with a completely different team of people and none of the information that she had agreed on with her OB is relayed or transmitted or people just aren't on the same page. So there's that breach in trust in the system because she believes that um, her, her desires and preferences weren't, weren't honored and the agreements weren't, um, weren't honored either. And then in terms of empowerment, um, you want to highlight strengths and focus on positive coping skills. And again, going back to that self-efficacy, building up their ability to, to feel confident in themselves and their ability to give birth, their ability to parent. Um, on my mental health birth plans, that looks like, okay, what are the coping skills that really help you through stress? And we write those things down, whether that's, I listen to music, I um, hold my, my partner's hand, I do counting exercises, I do breathing exercises. And so we really focus on those strengths as tools and the tool back that the patient is able to themselves pull upon during um, childbirth. So I just wanna make a, a brief note about birth, birth um, breastfeeding considerations um, during birth. So 
breastfeeding can have both positive and negative um, consequences during in the setting of like birth trauma. In the terms that it's positive, um, it can be a restorative or corrective experience. You know, in at times where women feel like they're or birthing people might feel like their bodies have betrayed them or things didn't go right and they are able to breastfeed, they really hold on to that as a metric of how good of a parent they can be or that things are going well, that the body's not failing them in this, in this, in this particular domain. So they really hold on to that as a corrective experience. On the other side of the spectrum, as a negative experience, people can have trauma echoes as it relates to um, breastfeeding. You know, as an intimate, you know, body part, it can be re-traumatizing or reminiscent of prior sexual traumas. Um, and so her birth planning really has to clarify the patient's breastfeeding goals. You don't want to assume that somebody's going to breastfeeding. You don't want to assume what the relationship with breastfeeding is going to be. And then you also want to engage or think about how to engage a lactation consultant in a trauma-informed way. Like the lactation consultant can come in and, you know, ask or assess um, what this patient's relationship is with their breastfeeding and what their specific goals are. Their goal may not be to breastfeed their child. They may want to stop lactation from happening. And so we just want to be cognizant and um, not risk re-traumatizing by putting so much focus on the, um, that intimate body part. And then also we want to re-emphasize the need to respect the patient's body autonomy and their privacy by asking for per permission to touch, um, to touch them, including um, their breasts as well. Um, and so that concludes my presentation. I just wanted to quickly acknowledge my predecessors, Dr. Kara Brown and Dr. Kate Salama. They were physicians in the traumatic birth program before me and have both done um, some version of this talk. So I'm certainly standing on their shoulders today in this presentation. So thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Raparhu. I um, wanted to uh, know that we do have one question um, so far in the um, Q and A, uh, and it is from Andrea Oliveira. I will I'll read it out, and um, if Andrea, if, if you're able to unmute, or if maybe our uh, facilitators can unmute you, then you can add to the question. But um, it, she asks, how do you define poor pain control? I think this was in um, earlier in the talk when you were speaking about uh, um, sort of risk factors and stressors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is a, um, a really important and like salient topic, particularly as it relates to like marginalized populations. A lot of people don't feel like their pain is taken seriously or adequately like managed or controlled. So I think it just begins with a conversation, right? Um, and those, those conversations can occur at multiple time points. So prior to birth, you can have conversations like how would you like to manage your pain during your birth? Some people prefer unmedicated births. And so for pain control, they do rely on things like, like hypnobirthing or uh, get, like, those bathtubs that you know that you get you get into that provide some like pain relief, or they use ice packs or heating packs. Um, that's a conversation that happens up front. And then you can, you can say, okay, let's say that you do all those things and it's not working for you. What would you like the next option to be? Um, and so up front, like in, in, um, before labor and delivery is even on like happening, you can have those conversations around pain control and really empower a patient to ask for what the next step in their plan is. Um, second is that some people, particularly marginalized people don't feel like their pain is taken seriously even during the process. So if they are in pain, it just means, you know, if they appear to be in pain or they're complaining of pain, stop, stop and assess. Um, it can also sometimes just knowing, I and mean, there's no sort shortage of coverage in the media about, you know, particularly like black women's needs not being recognized or met during labor and delivery. And I even remember experiencing this myself during my, after my the birth of my second child, I had really severe afterbirth pains that I didn't have the first time around, but I was afraid to ask for pain medication because I didn't want them to think I was like going to get addicted to yeah. the opioids or something like that. Um, and so, you know, had someone, if it wasn't something I had to ask for, it would have been much easier. Um, so just recognizing that pain is something that needs to be actively managed during the birth process and just having conversations about that, I think can go a long way.
questions. Um, if, if people have questions, please type them into the chat or feel free to raise your hand um, in the, in the, uh, the chat. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes, I, I see um, uh, Andrea Oliveira replied, uh, the slide, the poor pain control seems to put it on the mother. Yeah, I think it's the experience of having poor pain control during the birth process. Um, and so the places that during which, you know, pain can be addressed, you know, sometimes people have anesthesia consults prior to birth. You can talk about pain control during birth planning. You can have um, the clinicians involved in the birth be actively aware, obviously, that pain, the birth, birth is a painful process. And so just asking proactively, like, how is your pain? How is it being managed? Do you feel okay? Those sorts of things can really, I feel like, go a long way and involve the patient in um, pain management. <clears throat> Thank you for clarifying. This, the, the slide did, was not giving that vibe and I was yeah. I wanted to to know what what it meant um but that's that response to it because there's just been so much attention on how women's pain and in particular uh women of color is often neglected um yes, so thank yeah. you for for yeah. clarifying yeah so I think if a if a patient has perceives that their pain is not being addressed or they have a particularly painful experience that is a risk factor for traumatic birth or a risk factor for perceiving the experience as traumatic. Um, suggestions for OBs to communicate prenatal discussions with the delivery room. So that's a good question. So at the Brigham, um, particularly if I know if a patient has a, a, like a concerning like trauma history, I actually meet my, I, you know, I go through the birth planning with the patient and then I meet myself with the labor and delivery, um, like the head nurses, the ones who are in charge of, you know, assigning nurses on the day of delivery, you know, obviously if the, if the, if the patient has a scheduled delivery or even they just have a copy of the birth plan themselves like on file and we review it together. And so the leadership has the birth plan in advance, no matter who's there, they kind of are all on the same page. So when they're doing handoff or um, handing over clinical responsibilities, there's that consistency and care and everybody's on the same page. Um, I'm not quite sure how that works in other hospital systems, but um, sometimes people do, well, I don't know how it works in the pandemic now, but sometimes people do um, tours of the, of, you know, the um, labor and delivery units and they kind of like meet meet the players. Those can be good opportunities to bring up conversations. The patient can have the birth plan that comes with them and on the birth plan, you can say this was co-constructed or co-written with Dr. So-and-so. So they know it's not something that the, I mean, I feel like people take it a little bit more seriously when um, their physician, unfortunately, when their physician like does it with them or if it's in, actually in their chart themselves. I put my birth plans in the patient's chart. So there's multiple ways in which people have access to the plan. I do try to verbally talk about the plans with the um, stakeholders as well. Don't see any more questions, but we'll give people a, oh, I see one more. Do you have a template or a trauma-informed birth plan that we could share? Uh, I do. I can, I can maybe put it in my slides or I'm not sure. I can share it with, with we, or maybe that resource can be shared. Absolutely. We're happy to, to share that uh, when we send out the slides. We'll also have uh, a recording of today's uh, session and your PowerPoint slides um, on the website. So we'll make sure that all of that is sent out and shared on our website. So the, I just heard the first two episodes of the new podcast, zero to three, the earliest. Recommend to anyone interested. Oh, yes. Maybe I'll save this for myself. <laughs> I know that Dr. Matal had to step away uh, for, um, oh, fantastic. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, had to step away, but if there are any other questions, um, 
or otherwise, we can thank you uh, for joining us today. And uh, there'll be a short survey that will be sent out uh, asking so for some feedback after today's um, presentation. And we thank you so much uh, for your presentation. It was wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thank you.